also gives rest for our souls. And I took this key verse from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28, which says, Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Amen. That is the promise of God, that I will give you rest. Amen. Come to me, all of you, and I will give you rest. And we, I started off this for the verse that we started in the beginning of the year. That is from Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 to 12. Amen. If you can read me with me this verse, it'll be great. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Amen. And it has also the second part, which is filled with fruits of righteousness. But right now we are focusing on love. An overflow of love. This second part is filled with the fruits of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, that is the second part. And what Paul mentions over here, this is my prayer, that your love may abound. Praise the Lord. Our love will grow. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our love will grow. What we have received from God it will continue to grow in us. That is the prayer that Paul is praying over the Philippian church, that our, your love will grow. Amen? I mean, you, you can ask certain questions. How can our love grow? Amen? What is the meaning of that? There could, this can be interpreted in so many hundred thousand ways, but then there is one way that Jesus had mentioned, and Paul is saying here, he's saying your love will grow in knowledge and discernment. Amen? In knowledge and discernment. He wants our love to grow in knowledge and discernment. He says, what to love and why you're loving. Amen? What to love and why you are loving. Amen? There are so many stories of Love that goes on with, dif with different people. It says like, you know, love happens in different ways and different seasons. And people have at different stages of, your li of their life. I don't know, as husband and wife, what stage of your life you are right now. Amen. Uh, I, me and my wife, we've been married for 11 years now. We will finish 12 years in the coming year. And that is a different stage of our love. Amen. I can look back and say, hey, it was definitely different from the time when I, we were getting married and where we are right now. Amen. The, in, before marriage, there was a lot of excitement and there was a, a lot of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the phone, phone conversations was even more amazing. Like, you know, you would wait for the phone. Amen. Now you don't even pick up the phone. <laughs> oh, I'll call back later. Yeah, or maybe like I'll message later. You know, I'm just right now busy. You know, so, but there is, but we still, love is there. Amen. And then some of you are looking at each other. Yeah, I called you last time. <laughs> you didn't pick up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but there is a different stage of love in our lives too, as we go year by year. But can you say that love is gone? No. It is still there. Amen. It is still there. In fact, it is stronger. Praise God. As year passes by, the love has got stronger. The excitement has gone down. <laughs> the external excitement has gone down, but the internal growth has taken place. Amen? A internal understanding has taken place. Now you know why you love each other. And now you know why, what the other person likes to. Amen? And you know how to love the other person. Amen. Initially, we were just, wow, I just love that person. I don't know why, but I, I like, like his looks or her looks or whatever that person has and all those stuff. We were externally loving that person so much. But right now, we are not looking at the external. Amen. We know, oh, there are more handsome people. There are more beautiful people on this earth. But then I love the person who is that person. Amen. Now we love the person as we should. And it's going to get better. Amen. Amen to that. Amen. Amen. Years come pass by. Your love is going to get better. Amen. 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 Tell your spouse if your spouse is amen. Our love is going get, to get, get better. 
If your spouse is sitting beside you, you can turn to your spouse and give a smile at least. <laughs> if, you, if you feel so shy, that's okay. Love is going to get better. Amen. Amen. And Paul says this knowledge and this discernment, it has to keep getting better till the final day. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's, oops. Okay, I got it. So that's what Paul says. My prayer is that your love will abound more in knowledge and and in depth of insight so that you will be able to discern what is best and pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Amen. Our love will continue to grow in knowledge and we will continue to know what to love and why we are loving and also it should keep getting better till the final day. Praise the Lord. Amen. If you have been loving in a way that you had been loving yesterday or last year, this year, it has to change. It has to go a little more deeper. Amen? It has to abound more. Your knowledge of understanding of love has to grow more. Amen? And next year, it has to go to a next level. Amen? Praise the Lord. Your neighbor should be able to come and say, Hey, I see something in you. Amen? I don't know what is that, but I see amazing things in you. And I know that is not around. I see you are a different person. I want to be like you are. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If, if only our bellies grow and our, we lose our hairs as the years pass by, it's not a good development. <laughs> you need to do better. Amen. The pandemic has changed a lot of people. Like, you know, there were people saying, like, you know, shirts don't fit anymore and pants don't fit anymore. Uh, all, and women are tired of cooking, uh, cooking and cooking. But don't worry. Things will change. Amen. We believe that. Amen. <laughs> Things will change. Your, your pants will be back. Uh, you know, your shirts will be back. <laughs> you will get everything. All those things, you'll get it back. But then more than your physical future. Amen. God is asking us to grow from within. And that is a love that God wants us to grow. As the year goes by, as the walk with Jesus goes by, we get better at loving people. Amen. We get better at displaying the goodness and the love of our Christ Jesus to our neighbors and to our friends and to any person who comes across to our life. And that's what Paul prays for the Philippian church. I pray your love will continue to grow. And this love has to go beyond what the worldly standard is. Amen. As Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 5 verses 46 to 47. He, he said. For if you love those who love you. And what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your, your brethren only. What do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? What he was saying is that. Your love has to go beyond the worldly standard. Amen. Amen. There is a standard that the world keeps. They have a certain way that they do things and they have a certain way of getting along with life and their understanding has a certain pattern. God says we have to grow beyond that. Paul, Jesus said we have to grow beyond that. Your love cannot be like the worldly people. Amen. If a worldly people and you stand beside, there should be a difference between you and them. Amen. The way you talk, the way, you know, why you love and what you love. Praise God. Amen. Why you love and what you love, there should be a difference between us and them. The worldly people love certain things because they have reasons for that. And that's what Paul says. Our reasons of why we love has to be different. From the world. And, and Jesus said us that. And last time I spoke about this. The crazy thing, chase after the things in a worldly manner. That's what we need to change. Man. The crazy chase. Like you know we run. People run after things. And that's not what we are running after. Our race is in a different direction. Amen. And it has to be seen. Praise the Lord. Amen. How many of you agree with that? Amen. We have to, have to have a difference. Why we love and what we love. There has to be a difference. 
And you know what? When you start working on, on it, it's going to change your speech. Amen? It's going to change your thought process. It's going to change the way you look at things. It's going to change and transform us. And that's what the goal of Christ is in our lives. And when we were reading this, this is what the scripture that we, Jesus picked up and we focused on this too, Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 39. Can we read it together? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is the second scripture that uh, I picked up to win this messages. And here is what Jesus is calling us to learn from him. Amen. Amen. He is a best teacher. Hallelujah. As I wrote in the newsletter, if you read your newsletter, amen, Jesus is calling us to learn from him. He's saying, I'm going to be your teacher. Amen. Last time we heard how the yoke is upon us. He's calling us to take the yoke. Amen. On the other side, it is Jesus. Hallelujah. It's not someone else. Jesus is on the other side. And he, we look at each other when you're down, when you're in trouble. Amen. He understands you. He picks you back up again. Amen. Praise the Lord. And then he said, he gave a call to each one of us. Can we read this one too? Amen. Together. Come to me, all your weary and burden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Praise the Lord. Father God, we thank you for this word. I pray that your rest upon our souls will remain. And Lord, continue to enrich us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, take my yoke. Learn from me. I'm gentle. I'm humble. And then he said, and you will receive rest for your souls. Amen. Rest for your souls. Rest for your souls. Amen. Last time we said, as Jesus was teaching us, remember, he's not trying to blame you. Amen. When the teachers, most of the times when, you know, teachers have to look perfect. Amen. <laughs> teachers have to look perfect. And when they are in trouble, amen, they cannot be in trouble in front of their students. So they try to put it on the, some, find someone to uh, help them in their trouble. But that's not Jesus is. Amen. Amen. That is not who Jesus is. Jesus is working towards that point where you will get rest in your souls. Amen. Amen. Not, not trouble. Rest. He is not putting you in a, in a spot. But he is saying, he said, come to me, all your weary and burden. I will give you rest. It is a call of love. He calls lovingly and he says, come to me. Come to me, I will give you rest. If you're weary, if you're burdened, come to me. That's his call. And then he said, again, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, for you, and you will find rest. And then he said, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Amen? Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen? He is not saying... Oh, you're coming to learn one of the biggest thing on earth and I'm going to teach you the biggest thing. So pay attention. No. He's saying, come to me. Don't come with fear. Come with boldness. Come with confidence. This call is a call of love. I mean, no matter where you are, he says, come. Come because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's an easy yoke and a light burden. Amen. It's not hard. This is not a hard path that I'm pushing upon you. It's not a hard burden that I'm putting upon you. I'm saying, I'm promising this is an easy yoke and it is a light burden. Amen. I just put it in this way and said, he said, he would say, the syllabus is very easy and the teaching method is very smooth. Amen. But the enrollment is your choice. Amen. It is you who have to enroll yourself. Put your head, put, your, put the yoke upon yourself and say, I'm ready for it, Lord. Teach me. Amen? I'm ready for it. And then he says, when you do that, you find rest. Amen? 
Praise the Lord. I mean, have you gone to your classes and at the end of the class you have become more anxious? I didn't understand anything that I was taught today. <laughs> maybe I just slept off during the class. Or maybe I was just having, and now I understand that was the most important class of the, of the time. Amen. Jesus says, find rest. <laughs> rest. Because rest is something that the Lord is giving you. Amen. Rest is more than what we are talking about. Rest is not, not exactly the rest that you go, go back home and in the night you go underneath your bed after a nice meal or maybe after church you eat a nice meal and go find rest. No, that is not the rest that Jesus is talking about. Rest is actually good. Amen. It's nice. It refreshes you. It enriches you. Good. It, is, it has got meanings to that very good one. And this rest that Jesus is talking about has been ordained and planned by God. Amen? And Jesus is calling us to the same rest which God has planned for us. Amen? Amen? Sometimes we struggle to sleep in a bed like thinking about anxious thoughts. Amen? Jesus gives rest there too. The, the sleep at the night. But there is more than the sleep to this rest that Jesus is talking about. If we go to Genesis chapter 2 verses 2 and 3, here is where we read, on the seventh day, amen, God ended his work, not his personal work, not after making all food and all, no, he was working on the earth, amen. He was working on the earth, he was making it and the beauty, and finally ended making the beautiful earth, and it says, he had done, he rested on the seventh day. Yes. Praise the Lord. He rested on the seventh day. On the seventh day, after finishing up with the beauty, beautiful earth that you see today, he rested yes. from all his work which he had done. Amen. And the next verse says, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Praise the Lord. After making the earth and everything in it, he created everything, he made everything. And it says he rested on the seventh day. And then he goes on to bless the seventh day. And then it says he sanctified it. Amen. He sanctified it. He, sa he made it holy. He made the day holy. He, made, he said like this is a blessed day. And you know what? He set the earth on this foundation. Amen. If you go back into the earth and check everything. Amen. The weeks. Seven days a, a the weeks. If you go back. There's a lot of understanding on this. The whole world actually, whole world actually lives on the seven days. If you take the birth, amen, it is how many, how many weeks? How many weeks does a mom carry the baby? Come on, mothers. I only hear murmur, come on. 36? 40? We need to have a consensus on that. <laughs> Okay, but it is a week. Not just humans, even animals have the weeks. It is based on weeks, every week that they have, and that's how they give birth. God has set this into the system to have the weeks for us. And that's why we have weeks for us. Amen? That's why we run in on it. Amen? Amen? Amen. The calendar that you have is so much biblical. Amen. And it has been started and scripted by God himself. Amen. It is not made by a later today scientist or anything like that. It has been made by God himself. Can you just believe it? Can you just imagine how much of his system is still working on this earth? Amen. And then people can stand up and say, hey, there is no God. But they cannot deny, amen, that his fingerprints are all around. Amen. As I said last week, if you look at look for God, you'll find him everywhere. Yeah. Amen. If you look for God, you will find him everywhere. In everything, he is there. 
He is the one. And one of the best things that God intended for man is rest, which is ordained and planned by him. And he did it on the seventh day. On the seventh day, it says God blessed that seventh day and he sanctified it. He made it holy. The seventh day he set it apart and he made it holy. Now, if you look at the, in the, in the Old Testament, every consecrated thing is special. Amen? If you, if you love reading the Old Testament and if you go back into the Old Testament, God has said, okay, if you set this apart, it has a special way of living. Amen? If a, if a child, if a child is set apart, that child has to live a special life. If you set the bread consecrated on the table, it is supposed to be eaten by, only by the priest. And if there are certain things that if you consecrate, it has to happen that way. There is a special way for it. Like, you know, if a Nazarite, if someone has been consecrated as a Nazarite, that person cannot cut their hair. That person cannot drink uh, any drink. He has to be careful with his life. Amen. We know Samson was a Nazarite. Amen. He could not cut his hair. And he is, he is not supposed to drink anything that has alcohol in it. So, any, so there are a special way every consecrated thing is being done, is, being, is supposed to be done. And God had given this law into the hands of Israel. You know why? Why? Because the whole world was messed up. Amen. And God was creating a beautiful order back again, the same way he did. And he started off with Abraham and into Israel and through Israel into us. Amen. He was working it through back back into the life back into ours i don't know if they did weeks before that i don't know we have no history to prove that but then god did give the israelites sabbath and said like the seventh day you are going to rest amen amen that's where we see the seventh day coming back again we don't know how it was before maybe before they didn't they didn't even know but there was a seventh day <laughs> right they were just living their life as if every day. But then God made this special thing and he gave it back, worked it back into the Israelite and he gave them the commandment that you shall observe the Sabbath. But when Jesus came to earth, he started having problems with the Pharisees on the same topic of Sabbath. Amen. Sabbath something that they have received from God. The Moses passes on to them and they were living it and it was something that they followed very specially because it is a consecrated day. It is a holy day and it is a blessed day and they followed it and Jesus had got into a place which they didn't like it. And Pharisees said, you're breaking the Sabbath. You're breaking the Sabbath. Look at your disciples, they're breaking the Sabbath. You're doing things on Sabbath that is not supposed to be done. You are doing things which is wrong. And one of the things that they were like, how can he be a prophet if he is breaking the Sabbath? How can he be the Messiah if he is not keeping the Sabbath? And Jesus was stepping on their toes every time because every Sabbath there was some healing happening, some miracle happening. While all the land was silent and quiet, there was always something happening around Jesus. Amen. People were around him. People were getting healed. People were getting blessed. And they were like, come on, you are not doing the right thing. You are breaking the Sabbath. The day that God gave us. The holy day that we are supposed to keep. You know, why was Jesus getting into trouble with them? Because there is a thing that the Jewish schools had interpreted Sabbath into a different way. They had interpreted it into things that you can do and you cannot do on a, sun, on a seventh day. Amen? So what they did with the Sabbath, it was a list of do's and don't do's. Amen? Like when you send your kids to school, do you, you give them a list of do's and don't do's. Okay, don't talk to a stranger. Don't do that. Don't do here. Don't eat, you know, that and this. And eat this, this, this. There is a list of things that you go. And the kid, okay, goes and comes back. And, you know, only God knows how much they follow and how much they don't. But then we are believing that they would do it. Amen? And you know what? You just trust that they are doing it. Why? Because you love them. And you trust that they will do it because they love you. Amen. 
And then you're not going behind them, checking everything, have they followed from A to B and everything A to Z. No, but you are trusting because they love me, they will follow what I've given them. But over here, Pharisees, instead of making it a relationship of love between God and humans, they made into a things that man can do and cannot do. It became a legalism, a things of legalism. Okay, you are supposed to do that and not supposed to do this. You are supposed to, you know, there was a set of loose laws. If you go into that, sometimes it sounds funny. Because in the laws, what they did is that you could just go around so much place. You should not cross so many steps. Amen? Amen? You're only supposed to walk maybe 20 steps or maybe like 100 steps. So, you know, it's not like uh, a stride. Like, you know, you walk more. It's like you walk limited. So, like, you know, if it is 50 steps, you have to make sure that, you know, you use the 50 steps for the best things. Okay, I need to go to the restroom and that is like 10, 10 steps. I need to go to the... Uh, bedroom that is like five steps okay so what people did they were calculating the steps all the time and they were thinking okay I took now 25 steps now okay I need to keep it because if I have to emergency go to the restroom I'll be in trouble I cannot you know all those things the people were going around this and thinking around this and people were okay so many steps and so many things and so many that and this and people were kind of Caught up in this legalism trying and the end of the day, okay, I only walked 50 steps so I have really pleased my God today. So easy, right? <laughs> Amen. I've pleased my God because I've kept my steps within 50 steps or, you know, whatever that number of steps was. That was the way they followed Christ. Just imagine your husband and wife relationship was like that. A set of do's and don't do's. Do that, don't do this. Do that, don't do this. Amen? If that was the way our relationship was there, man, it would have been big trouble. Some people think that is easier. You know, I don't have to keep fighting all the time. Everything goes smooth. But God called us beyond that. And he said, it is not a set of do's and don't do's. It is a time which God said, it is holy and it is blessed. Amen. And that's why when Jesus countered this step, he said in Matthew chapter 12, verses 7 to 8, it starts in chapter 12, starts with the disciples eating the grain with the hands. And Jesus says, uh, and the Pharisees come and say, hey, your disciples are breaking the Sabbath. And the conversation goes down and he says, but if you had known that what it means, amen, what real Sabbath means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Amen. Now this is totally against what the Israelites believed. Because they felt God will be pleased if I sacrifice. And God wants sacrifice. God wants the blood to be spilled around and all around the altar. That's what they had, they had understanding. And Jesus said, no, I am saying I desire mercy, not sacrifice sacrifice you would if you would have understood it you would not have condemned the guiltless amen you would not have condemned the wrong person amen you would have caught the real thief amen you would have not caught the wrong person I mean, just imagine the wrong person if they get into the prison and they get executed for crimes that they have not committed amen Amen. We think, oh, that justice is so bad and that, oh, no, 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 no. How many times we have done that? How many times we have executed all those people inside of us? Like, you know, we are, oh, that person, ah, you know, he said that to me. They, that person may not have even intended or said in their heart or in the mind, but we already judged them. And Jesus said, for the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. What he said is that, I am the one who started it. Amen? And I'm here to teach you what this really means. Praise the Lord. He said, like, if you understand what God really wants, what God really desires, he said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, not another killing, not another blood shedding, not another one to suffer. But if you would have understood that I desire mercy, 
you would have understood my message. And he said, my message is, you know, don't end up condemning the guiltless when you are supposed to love them. And from there, Jesus describes what is, what is Sabbath. He said, it is not about keeping a do's and don't do's. It is not about following a set of rules and thinking that I have pleased God because I did this 50 things. I've done this and I'm good enough. That is not what God is saying. God is saying we are having a relationship here. And he's saying like if you are coming to Sabbath, it is a place, it is a time where you understand who I am and what I am and what I want to tell you. Amen. Church, if you think you have just ticked off a checklist in the presence of God because you came to church today and your mind is all around the globe, I want to tell you, you have missed the point. Amen. You could come here, right here, and make everybody see that I'm a very good man, I'm dressed, or very good woman, or a very good child, I've dressed up properly, I've dressed up for the occasion, I've done everything, I'm clapping my hands, I'm singing at the top of my voice, I've done everything, and I am a good Christian in all of your eyes. If you are thinking that you have done that, you miss the whole point. Because God is not looking at how much you did and how much you didn't do, He's going beyond that because he has a relationship with you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Sabbath is not about set of things of doing and don't do. It is a relationship. It is a place where you come to seek him and him alone. Praise the Lord. Sabbath is a time where we come into the presence of God, that we take everything aside, and then all the things that we have, take all the garbage out and sit in the presence of God and say, God, fill me. Praise the Lord. That is when he pours into you. It is a holy time. It is a blessed time. It is a consecrated time. It is not a usual time. It is not like the worldly thing. It is something special. It is beyond what we are thinking and understanding. And I tell you, church, this is the time that you receive what you have to receive from God. Amen. Amen. Your pockets don't grow when you come here. Amen. 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 Your, your body don't grow when you come here. But there is something inside of you that is growing as you sit in the presence of God. A man, there is a love that he wants to pour into you. There is a message that is speaking into you. There is a power that is pouring onto you. And that causes transformation. And that is happening right now in the presence of God. Church, there are times when we come into the presence of God and we judge everything. We sit down just like a worldly person. We sit down as we lived our, lived our six days and we come into the presence of God and we look around and our eyes say those things to us and we get deceived by that. Oh, church, church, when Jesus said, if you are worshiping God, you got to worship him spirit and in truth, not in your flesh. You have to go beyond your flesh and connect with him in your spirit. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. As we read in the scripture, man sharpens iron. Man. Amen. Iron sharpens iron. Diamond sharpens diamond. Amen. But our spirit is sharpened by the spirit. Praise the Lord. And man, you have a whole spirit inside of you which gets sharpened, which gets tuned, which gets enriched by the Holy Spirit and not by the evil spirit. Praise the Lord. There's a lot of baggage I know we have carried today. And man, there's a lot of things that we have carried. Sometimes you may feel, oh, this baggage is not hurting. Actually, I'm liking this baggage. But church, I want to tell you those baggage is hurting. It's hurting you. It's hurting others. It's hurting everybody. And in the long run, it is bad. But today is a time, the seventh day, as you come into the presence of God, if you can 
Cut out the things that you have been involved in. If you can cut out everything that you... Oh, sometimes we may think, okay, Sunday is a good time to catch up with my friends. Sunday is a good time to go on all my social media, get updated. If Sunday is a good time to do all those. Church, you are just filling yourself with the world one more time. Amen. Amen. Can you just take that day and say, God, I don't want to get on social media on Sunday. I don't want to get the things of this earth on Sunday in my life. I don't want to be like the person who catches up with the things of this world. I want to catch up with you. Praise the Lord. I want to catch up with God. God, what are you doing in my life? What are you doing through me? What are you doing in this situation, in this world right now? What are you doing? And I want to know that because on the seventh day, God rested and he blessed it. And he said, there is a relationship in the Sabbath. Amen. It is not a set of do's and don't do's. It is a relationship that grow that grows through within you. Amen. Church, I want to remind you. Amen. As you come into the presence of God. Amen. This is not a place of condemnation. This is a place of God's growth, God's transformation inside of you. But don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. I mean, don't, don't just say, oh, okay, God is anyway watching me. He knows me. I will catch up on Monday. I'll make it up on Tuesday. And Wednesday will be a good day to do, to back into the Bible study. No, church, don't leave it what you have to do today. Just keep it. Just do it. Hold on to the Lord. If this is your day with the Lord, keep this day with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Don't, 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 don't separate this. Don't, don't just keep, okay, Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon and Sunday evening. I'm going to plan all those plans and spread it across Sunday. Remember you church, there is a group in, in this northern side of America which think they're post-Christian. Now what is post-Christian? They've grown out of Christianity. They're no longer Christianity. Amen. Well, I was in Canada, and one day we were driving from a meeting after Sunday, and uh, we were going from Edmonton to Cal- Calgary. And on the way, I was dry- we, were si- we were sitting with the brother, and we had a Sunday service, and we were going. And I saw this rally happening on Sunday. A rally, and this rally is all old cars, antique cars. And I was looking at each one of them. I was like, beautiful. But unfortunately, unfortunately, those people got so interested in the antique things of this earth, but they forgot the eternal God. They forgot on a Sunday, they're going on a rally, which is displaying their antique cars when the almighty God is waiting there, a man with a relationship. I mean, tell me, church, how will not we in this nation, this nation, North India, North America, a man, Canada, will not go back into the darkness? Why are the generations getting lost? Why are people getting confused? If people forget to keep the day with God, it's not going to work out. Amen. Praise the Lord. Jesus, when he spoke to Simon in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, he said, Simon, Simon, in that Satan had asked for you that he may swift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. That your faith will not fail. And when you return to me, strengthen your brethren. Amen. We have a high priest. Hebrews chapter 4, 14 to 16. He says, seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus Christ, the son of man, let us hold fast to a confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. But it was in, our po- in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He has gone ahead of us. He has taken victory. Therefore let us come boldly into the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to, to help in time of need. He's saying come boldly. Come boldly. Amen. Man, six days, don't let it tire you. I mean, six days, don't let it take you away from God. Six days, don't let it make you forget about God. Six days, so many things has happened. So many things has distracted you. Six days, so many things has tried to take your attention. But on this seventh day, I want to remind you, church, no matter what part of your life is today, come into the presence of God. Get connected with you. 
Because if you get connected with him on this day, he will remain connected with you for the next six days. He will. He will. He said, I am Emmanuel, God with us, not for a moment, but forever. He wants to dwell with us, live with us, live through us. Amen. He is here to grow through us his love. Church, I want to remind you, amen, don't take this thing very lightly. No, don't, don't subdue it. Don't mix it with things because there is a generation that is coming after you. Amen. There is a generation that is watching you. There is a generation that is getting this from you. Amen. They look at you. They watch you. They understand you. And if you are just playing around, amen, they will think this is not something great. They're going to take it as simple as possible. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 says, Train up a child the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Amen. Train up them. Train up them. Let them see you. Amen. Let them see you. That you, you take care of Sunday. You take care of your time with God. You take care of your presence with God. And you are there in the presence of God receiving. Let them see you receive. And when you receive, Amen. Amen. They will not be disturbed. Church, last week, if you read the news, I don't know how many of you read this. It's found that the, most of the emergency cases that is happening on the earth, uh, in the U.S. is from stress. Amen? It's no longer sickness. It is stress. Mental stress. And they are saying majority of them is teenagers. Young children. And they are saying... High schoolers, come on, high schoolers, when did they start thinking about what they're going to eat tomorrow? Amen. When did the stress come upon them? But they're saying in high schoolers are ending up in hospital with stress. Amen. Church, the word says in he Probes chapter 18, verses 14, the spirit of man will sustain him in sickness. But who can bear a broken spirit? Amen. If you're sick, you can get better. Amen. If you're ill, you can still talk good words to them and encourage them. They can still have that good attitude. But if they're broken, if they're depressed, if they're stressed out, amen, who can bear it? No one. Amen. Stress, depression, and this is not what God made us for. God made you for rest, not stress. Amen. If you jumble up those words, rest and stress, it has both the same letters, except that it got two extra S on stress, and it's got jumbled up. Amen. We take world into us, we get jumbled up with life. Add some more things of this earth. And when we are confused, we don't know why this is happening. Because we just lost the rest, which we had to get it from God. It was rest that you made for, not stress. Church, I want to remind you, today as you are in the presence of God, if you can rest on the Lord, receive the rest in the Lord. I don't know what phase of your life you are right now going through. There are so many hundred things that can bother you, that can make you anxious. But God made the seventh day for you to rest in Him. As you're in the presence of God, receive it from the Lord. I heard a story from one of our family members. They said when they were in India, they used to go to church and the Sunday service used to start at nine and end at four. So morning nine days to go and come back at four. And the neighbors used to wonder what they're doing on Sundays. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But one thing they can stand and testify, God is good. I received my rest from him. I received it from him. I pass it on to my children. And I'm blessed. Not with my pockets. May not be much in my pockets, but then I'm 
definitely blessed. I can say that. Let's worship the Lord.